in these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zeiger livecast. Good evening and uh, welcome to this uh, special live cast as part of the Media Architecture Biennale 2020. Today we will talk about the impact of media architecture on our cities, the promises that surround new technologies and the futures that are implied in all these urban media that increasingly find their way into the cities. My name is Martijn de Waal. I'm a professor at the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences, the Play and Civic Media Research Group. And together with Nana Verhoef, Michiel de Lange and Frank Surenbroek, I'm also the executive committee of the MAB20. Uh, um, today I will address those questions with five really interesting guests. We're really glad that they're here. Stephen Petterman, architect from the Netherlands here in the studio. Uh, we'll move on then to Brazil, Maria Pasculi, who is residing in Sao Paulo and then we'll continue to Australia, where Glenda Coldwell and Marcus Foth will join us to end up in Plymouth, United Kingdom, with a, a contribution from Catherine Willis. Before we go there, um, let's spend a minute or two to talk about media architecture itself. What is media architecture and uh, why is it interesting or important to look at the promises around these new technologies? Well, media architecture is a new interdisciplinary field uh, that brings together on the one hand the design of media technologies uh, and on the other hand uh, the design of the built environment. So you can think of uh, urban screens, media facades, interactive lighting installations on buildings, uh, art installations in public space, but also increasingly uh, you can think of sensor network, internet of things, digital platforms that in some way or another help us find a way around the city. And in the beginning, media architecture was mainly concerned with the media that we actually see in the cities. So the big screens, the, the vibrating signs, the outside of big department stores, uh, and the aesthetics and the experience of that. But increasingly in the world of media architecture, the people who, who are studying, making, designing it are also looking at the media uh, technologies that we don't see in the city. Uh, the algorithms, the platforms, the sensors, the Internet of Things that also play a role in yeah, how we shape and experience our cities. And um, <coughs> all these technologies are, and that's I think one of the most important points that we want to make tonight, they're not neutral, right? They, they are not just an enabling technology, but they are designed from a particular perspective, a particular worldview. And sometimes that worldview remains unspoken. Uh, often uh, these promises and the worldviews are actually made explicit. And then these new technologies, they come with grand visions of how they will make our cities brighter, more interesting, more interactive, uh, more personal and more efficient as well. Um, what we want to do today is have a look at these technologies and the promises and the impact that they could have at the cities. Because at Media Architecture Biennale 2020, one of our aims is to yeah, further also the discipline of media architecture um, and to really understand it um, as uh, a combined discipline that brings together the design of those media and the design of those urban spaces uh, from an integrated perspective. So not just slapping on a screen onto a space after it's built, but really thinking through what does it mean to have a screen in that space? What does it do with the people who are there? How does it alter the spatial relationship of that place and the people with that places? What does it mean maybe even for the greater natural ecology um, of the city as well. So that is what we're going to talk about today. We have four really interesting guests, as I already said, and the first one is here in the studio. Uh, welcome, Stephen, Stephen Petterman. Um, you're an architect, you're in your own studio, a uh, man. Um, and I think a lot of people uh, probably have seen your work because you have done a lot of collaborations uh, with Rem Kohas for some of the exhibitions uh, that he made, uh, Fundamentals, amongst others, at the Venice Architecture Biennale, more recently, Countryside, uh, which opened right before all the lockdowns worldwide uh, in New York, in the Guggenheim. Yes. 
Um, we've worked together earlier this year also mm -hmm. with the people from uh, Arcus and uh, Volume Magazine uh, organizing uh, a training school in the context of the media architecture called Promises Promises. And in that training school, uh, yeah, the people who participated also uh, explored the promises of all those new technologies. We're going to talk about that in a second, uh, but first... Um, yeah, why is an architect uh, like you interested in the in the promises of of new technologies? And why is it urgent or important to talk about those? Uh, I'm an I'm an architect and an, more moreover an architecture historian. So the, I'm per definition interested in longer time spans and longer views. Uh, what fascinated uh, us at some point when we were working on the fundamentals exhibition, uh, we were working on a project called Elements of Architecture, where we were speculating both on the history and on the future of some of the most basic components of architecture. Um, so the wall, the floor, the door, the ceiling, the elevator, the escalator, or uh, uh, 15 in total. And one thing that we noticed is that more and more uh, we, uh, that there were digital uh, variations happening in most of these elements. Uh, most of them were getting digitized and we were puzzling uh, on the fact what, what does it mean, first of all? What does it mean when uh, rooms are filled with sensors which used to be uh, dormant or silent but suddenly they, re they become responsive? Uh, and how can we address this? Uh, this was in 2014 when we, uh, when we did this exhibition and uh, earlier in the year we uh, yeah we wanted to reinvestigate actually what happened with most because most of them were in a promising phase. Also later we found out that this around this time period around 2012 14 there was specifically a lot of speculation uh, happening also on Internet of Things. Uh, obviously it's not died out, but uh, we have. Uh, but we just wanted to see what uh, what what happened actually with those. All what happened things. with all those promises? So we brought some of those uh, yes. examples from fundamentals here. Uh, smart elevators. What, what what do we see? Uh, uh, anything from uh, smart toilets who kind of tell you uh, more, give you quite ex uh, detailed review of the content that you just delivered, uh, from personalized heating systems to pathway designs to walls, obviously, it, that become interactive, uh, and uh, uh, Roombas uh, f cleaning your house, uh, automated wind shading, uh, sunlight shading. Uh, yeah, in every domain you found, basically, wherever you looked, you found like a digital version. Um, I remember myself seeing a presentation uh, from Ram Kohas about the exhibition. And one of the pictures that he showed there, and uh, I didn't bring it with me today, but I th I, it has always struck me because it was a picture of, I think it was a beautiful painted ceiling of a, of a chapel mm. um, from probably the 17th century or the 18th century, I'm not exactly sure. And then he showed a picture of the space that architects have today. And then half of that space was actually filled up with all kinds of ducts, wires, uh, yes. an extra layer. And I think yes. the point he wanted to make was before we as architects, we controlled the whole space. And now increasingly, it's all these other layers of in infrastructure that more and more confi confine our roles uh, exactly. of architects. Yes, exactly. Um, how is that with this digital media? Well, there, I mean, you see also, you see really different uh, types of interfaces. Uh, uh, some of them uh, are maybe more easy to understand. Some of them have quite deep social implication. For example, the floor element that you see here is uh, a sensor uh, triggering uh, uh, intended for uh, elderly homes when you fall down that to, uh, like it sends a signal. But obviously you could also use it for tracing who, when you're home, what you're doing, etc. So it has... Uh, a lot of different layers, uh, also for meaning. And uh, obviously we were also in touch with some of the parties in Silicon Valley and all of these areas to to see where architects could collaborate in this field with them uh, together. And we had some conversation, for example, with Nest, uh, which is a company by Google, but also with Cisco and some other parties. And at that moment, there, there was this whole privacy thing that was really not taken ex as serious at all. Even if you would raise some form of criticism or some sort of comment from your perspective, you would be basically uh, 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 slowly ex uh, uh, moved to the exit or you were sort of uh, executed. Uh, uh, obviously, after that moment, a lot happened in that respect. And that made it even more urgent, I think, to revisit actually the promises that the they promises, made. Uh, they believed so much in their own promises that they weren't open for any of the criticisms. Exactly. Uh, uh, and also what you describe is actually uh, the architects who uh, used to be maybe sort of the main force in sort of the development of cities, often working maybe from 
a public realm perspective or from sort of a professional ethos, all of a sudden we're competing in that space with all these yeah, uh, Silicon Valley funded companies, which were coming from a very different uh, direction. Yeah, the disruptors and everything. And obviously uh, we're super great uh, and thankful for innovation in the field. And, and as long as we can also contri contribute or collaborate, it's really great. Uh, and, but, but yeah, it, it remained a very puzzling, difficult position for us to take. Yeah. Um, so, like you said, all the more important to have a look at what exactly are those promises. Uh, we, we investigate that in a training school. Um, can you say a bit of how we set up that program? Yeah, basically, uh, we divided a lot of uh, different of these elements uh, across uh, the group of um, uh, group of students, where each uh, student uh, would take, for example, one element, like, okay, what happened with the smart toilet, or what happened with the smart element, or we'd also looked at cities like Masdar or the sidewalks uh, uh, example, and we really tried to figure out both what is happening at the moment, uh, and both what was the premise, actually, did, were there previous iterations that already explored this idea maybe in the 50s or in the 19th century or whatever uh, and then also uh, reflect on uh, what, is, what the outlook is so what happened after the promise was made yeah. and then we called uh, the postmas right yeah postmas and exactly. uh, uh, yeah, yeah we made, we made it into a into a super uh, extensive timeline where basically every student got one line and just could fill in if there's some an event happening at a certain moment uh, for your project you could add it so here you see like a halfway review moment uh, starting to fill up the space in the end it became quite full where also you could draw larger parallels between a lot of these uh, different elements of when were they peaking or when were they uh, dormant. Uh, so you could see larger uh, collisions of, uh, of attention. Yeah, because what uh, oh, uh, I remember at the end of the, the workshop, we stood in front of that wall and we saw sort of particular clusters emerging in particular time spaces. Um, what struck you the most? Well, there was this, uh, obviously, this 50s moment is uh, extremely uh, important uh, around this uh, dawn of the space age. Uh, you see a lot of speculation, specifically on the consumer society rise. Uh, you see, obviously, the, the role of the housewife uh, changes, and she would then be enabled through all kinds of tech already to, uh, uh, to really modernize the way uh, life is. Uh, and you see that basically some of them have been fulfilled, but others are still problematic. Like uh, the refrigerator, it's uh, been uh, like something from the 50s already, and we never really got to it. So I'm also very interested in why we can't make some elements work and some are have been successful. Like the Roomba was already predicted in the 50s that we would have it, and actually we, now we obviously we have it. Um, so yeah, we also wanted to to give that to the, the students basically that not everything is happening at the moment. A lot of it's the reflex of the historian in me that sort of everything. Uh, has already happened once, uh, but it gets regurgitated or gets reviewed or gets redeveloped at a, another point. And it's our mission also to learn from that past and to really make sense of it. Yeah. But, uh, what, of course, strikes is that a lot of those images from the 50s, uh, they were, um, I think, like the smart city services today, very much focused on sort of individual consumer products uh, or services. Yeah. Um, at the same time, um, I think in that time, uh, this is also when um, cybernetics became popular. Uh, it was well, maybe a few years later, so Archigram emerged, uh, a, a group of avant-garde architects in the United Kingdom who were predicting actually interactive cities by moving parts of the city around. Um, people started also studying uh, data and they thought that if you start to assemble data, you could make, a, make better predictions of what would happen in cities. Uh, sort of almost the whole discussion that we have today. Um, but that also, I mean, what ha, ha, that, that was sort of popular in the 60s up to yeah. the early 70s, and then sort of the way in the way. How did that happen? Well, there's, uh, there's one uh, story by Jay, uh, Jay Forrester. He was one of the mathematicians behind also the Club of Rome forecasting uh, about oil. Uh, he was one of the first to explore this for urbanism. Uh, and he uh, built a model for the city of Atlanta, basically what to do with uh, like the impoverished areas of the city. And uh, his model, basically, should we scrape it or should we replace it? And should we replace it with what? 
and the model his model actually predicted based on a number of parameters that it would be good to clear slums and replace it with luxury condominiums uh, which uh, politically at that time was not really uh, feasible so the model got dumped uh, and got actually transformed into the first sim city game so i think uh, maybe at that uh, at at that moment of great anticipation, you also saw already that there were some difficulties in also how do you program and how do you get this, these things to deal with the extreme complexities of the built environment. Um, so I guess that's where a first um, uh, attention wane happened. And then obviously around the 2000 bubble, etc., you see a lot of new ideas emerging uh, as well again. You uh, see some of the same problems coming back, but also some of the same promises, but also some of the same problems. I remember myself from, um, uh, and I think an example from the 1960s or 70s, Rand Corporation also started to do digital models of cities and based on all kinds of data analysis, they advised uh, the city of New York that they could do with, uh, I think, 20% less of their um, of their fire uh, fighters, uh, um, sort of the the places where they have all the trucks, uh, because they they had made this model that uh, from a particular place they could be anywhere in the city. But then in the model they forgot to calculate that sometimes there is actually rush hour, uh, so the, <laughs> there is actually a lot of traffic and the time that it takes for a truck to to get to the fire is a lot more. Yeah. So for a while a lot of more fires happened than than would have happened um, in ah. that time. So there is this there is this interesting relation between uh, on the one hand the promise of prediction, but it could also lead to some sort of a hubris, like where if we have all the data, we can make the best decisions. Yeah, exactly. So I think promises these promises come at a cost uh, at some point. Uh, Obviously, uh, we all understand why uh, companies are interested in making promises at uh, Las Vegas uh, fairs and all of these other places. Um, um, but they don't come for free for society because it also, I think, it creates a lot of uh, disillusionment in the background. When, hey, uh, like, for example, the, the, all the battery reports that we've seen, like uh, that, oh, we found now the new battery and then still my phone is draining uh, faster than ever, it seems. Uh, so there, there's a... There's a there can be a gap, and that's not bad per se. Obviously, uh, uh, innovation goes with disappointment, and we also have to deal with disappointment. But at the same time, yeah, this mechanism of trying to be honest or trying to to take the air out of the debate was actually one of the uh, key points in this uh, workshop. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we also looked at uh, more recent projects, uh, the smart cities that, that uh, promises that took their height uh, well, I think in the last few years, uh, although right after uh, we finished our workshop and the COVID uh, virus uh, conquered the world, uh, Google or Alphabet also pulled the plug from one of their uh, yeah, yeah. their flagship projects, eh? the one in Toronto, the yeah. sidewalk. Yeah, and that came at the same moment, at least when I read it, uh, as a, like a devastating uh, report by Andreessen also about how incredibly uh, Silicon Valley failed in the whole COVID uh, situation, that they basically produced nothing new and they were really unable to, to bring anything of value to the rest of the world in this time of crisis. And that was actually a deep dis uh, yeah, uh, embarrassment. Uh, and together with the embarrassment, I think, of this, again, the, like this enormous promise that was made by Alphabet and Google about sidewalks, um, that, that yeah, just made this moment maybe very interesting to reflect again on what is the value of this smart city? Who are we positioning it for? How are we communicating? Which parts are still relevant? I mean, I, I wouldn't say that we should <laughs> dump the whole effort, uh, but uh, maybe like uh, a different way of communicating, a different way of managing expectation, a different way of positioning uh, the debate is probably maybe which, which uh, would benefit both these companies who've massively invested in smart technology, smart city, blah, 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 uh, and the public, I think. And this exchange, that's why I like your program, uh, that we can have a platform where we can have this debate. Right. Uh, and indeed, I mean, I think what you stressed is uh, the goal also of the workshop was not just to be critical. Um, uh, actually, we had a lot of fun, but we also saw a lot of really interesting promises yeah. in those technologies. Um, maybe to, to, um, to, to uh, end this conversation, what was the technology or the development that you found most promising or most interesting? Well, uh, uh, 
one of the most fun ones, which uh, we also experimented with in the Elements of Architecture ex exhibition, was an elevator which could not only go vertically, but it could also move horizontally. And there, uh, that project has been continuing, uh, luckily, and uh, I think they're installing the first one, the first uh, elevator that can go horizontally uh, in Berlin, I think, somewhere later this year. And uh, also when you think about COVID and personal spaces, etc., uh, obviously the elevator has become a very, uh, yeah, uh, uh, an element we have to really uh, rethink. Um, so that was for me, I think, one of the most interesting ones that, that, that survived uh, uh, in this whole effort. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Stephen. Thank you. Um, and uh, from the promises of all those new technologies, we're now moving on to our next guest, who is uh, Maria Pasculi. And Maria is joining us uh, through Zoom from Sao Paulo. She's a curator, she's an artistic director at the Verve Cultural Center, has organized lots of interactive media festivals, amongst others the SP Urban Digital Festival. Uh, and um, a lot of her work is actually about the role and uh, impact that media architecture can have on public space. Uh, Maria, hello, uh, good evening. Hi, good hello, thank you for the pleasure being here and a part of this important uh, panel. Yeah, it's great to have you. And um, um, uh, we were um, discussing um, uh, earlier this week um, mm -hmm. your, your contribution. And then you mentioned, uh, and that I found really interesting, that in Brazil, media architecture is actually playing uh, increasingly a large uh, role in um, yeah, activating public space, amongst others in um, protest movements. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, yeah, many of these groups uh, emerged in 2013. Uh, initiate the protests that occupy and mobilize the nation. And there are, there are groups uh, acting and protesting, uh, using media architecture and using these um, projectors and LEDs, all these tools uh, to um, communicate to a massive audience in a large scale. That started in 2013, mostly with guerrilla uh, actions because uh, but since 2013, there is the Clean City Law in Sao Paulo, which outlined all uh, propaganda and publicity, as well political and ideological propaganda. So, so, but so during the manifestation and during these protests and these acts, uh, TV was covering up back in, the, in 2013. So, this, there was a way also to amplify this message, this message and the guerrilla and the protests being even more uh, uh, power. Yeah, so what you're saying is uh, there was uh, this new law in, in Sao Paulo and all uh, billboards and uh, pu yeah. public displays of either uh, political propaganda or commercials uh, was completely uh, prohibited. And then media architecture more or less started to fill that gap. Uh, you brought some examples. This one is uh, actually from a right wing uh, protest movement, right? Exactly. What, what uh, are this, we seeing? Actually, this building, uh, this project was my, uh, my project for uh, Urban Media Art Gallery at Fiesp building, but during this protest in, uh, protests in 2013, the president of the Federation of the Industry that owns the building just stopped the, uh, completely stopped the, the, um, the exhibition and projecting the, this impeachment for 40 days, which it was, it was uh, not, uh, not uh, possible, like uh, not legal, and the debuted it in three million reais for it. Yeah, because what we're seeing is actually a, a landmark building on uh, Paulista, yeah. uh, one of the main avenues in, in Sao Paulo. Uh, you have actually been worked uh, with that facade because it consists of all these uh, lights mm -hmm. um, as an artistic canvas. But here we see that the owner of the building actually uh, yeah, hijacked yeah. it to uh, call for the impeachment of uh, Dima Rousseff, I think it was at that time, right? Yes, yes, Yuma Rousseff. And uh, but uh, what is important is to highlight that uh, this this actions and the process in the media architecture really became strategically for to, uh, to use it to mass communication, not only political but also uh, social uh, social communication, like social expressions, like we are having now in two thousand twenty. Uh, that are people which projectors of just uh, society and citizens 
are reclaiming the public spaces. With, right. Uh, yeah. yeah. You brought some more examples. Um, this one is, yeah. I think, a recent one. Uh, yeah, it's one of my Bolsonaro. favorites. Right. Yeah, How people who are really creative, they just map it. Um, so, great mapping against uh, Bolsonaro. Um, this is a guerrilla project, right? So this is just yes. people... So how does it work? So people just go out with a beamer from their car or how should I imagine that happening? Yeah, th actually many actually happen by the windows. And that's what makes Sao Paulo movement really interesting is that our architecture really allow it to do it. Like we have high buildings and high uh, demographic density. And, and, and uh, cheaper, cheaper projectors that we have like nice and great uh, bright that you can use it from their own home. So the, there was just people uh, it's, and mostly it's about a collective called Projetemos that's formed by around 200 VJs all over the, the, the Brazil, which uh, started to doing this actives and protests. Right, and they, yeah. so it's a group sort of informally organized um, and they beam these kind of things from their own windows on the buildings on yeah. the upper side. Yeah. yeah, at the beginning was just uh, uh, informally and, uh, and just random against, against Bolsonaro and also, but what makes really, really uh, pot uh, potentialize it is that um, in the quarantine, people could not go, uh, citizens could not go to the, to the cities, uh, to the city, and actually protest with the signs. So this kind of guerrilla projection became very powerful to to give voice for the people that could not go to the streets and protest with their own handmade signs. Right. And it was also a, a combination of uh, political, environmental, uh, sanitary, and uh, financial economic crisis that makes uh, this movement so strong. Yeah, this uh, was this, this was. Um, I just called up a slide uh, with a project from yourself uh, that you yourself did. Can you tell us a bit more about it? What are we looking at? Yes, I'm really thankful for this. My 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 apartment of my friend that has this great view, and I invited and also collaborated with another uh, artist from Sao Paulo that calls Verena Smith. And when the and by the day that uh, coronavirus uh, re, uh, killed it in Brazil. 100,000 people, we projected this image, which means uh, in Portuguese has a, 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 a double message. That means 100 deaths and no more deaths than uh, our own protest. Right. Yeah, and that was uh, seen in many cities. And it also got a, a double live on social media, I think. Yes, that's, that's, that made it really powerful during the lockdown and quarantine that the urban space were reclaimed and, uh, and combined it with social media dissemination. Yeah. Um, uh, I was just going to say, um, and those protests could be re get really loud as well. Let's just have a look at a clip here. Yeah. What's happening here? Yeah, I'm not talking because there's some noise. Maybe you cannot hear it. But uh, what uh, during this, the beginning of the sanitary crisis, uh, the president used to go to the, the online to the live TV around eight o'clock in the evening to communicate it about the the corona and how how to handle the situation, and then the people used to go to the streets and pro uh, to the windows and protested with the pants and making noises, and that's how uh, it was a perfect time to pro project. And we are also projecting a lot of. Uh, a lot of these images, a lot of this, I sorry, a lot of these videos. But what is what? And then what? Um, this panelasso and this movement that brings up people to the window make it uh, very important how to re uh, re resignify the windows, not uh, merely as um, membranes from the public and uh, private spaces, but also as the interfaces. Uh, like interfaces of communication in urban spaces. Right. And uh, uh, with this movement, what is also things very interesting is that when people were in, this, in, the, in the windows and actually seeing and hearing and protesting, a lot of other movements were happening at the same time. Um, many groups were, uh, art groups, curators, was using this moment as a, as a way to also 
promoted culture and art during lockdown. Right. And uh, that's uh, one project that I think is very nice is the SCP Corona films that after the, the Panelasso is starting to project classical movies and theater. Uh, I myself um, have a friend, we, we were projecting dance from this group, um, it's very famous for contemporary dance, Grupo Corpo, that make it uh, for free, the, the spectacles during this month of yeah. lockdown. And yeah, also because in, um... that's Art Connector with the SP Urban that was in Guerrilla by, in the beginning, by the way, to, to invite artists and promote it and transmit art from over 15 artists during lockdown. Yeah, because yeah, you use uh, the the cultural spaces closed down in in Brazil, so many of the cultural manifestations uh, also uh, made use of media architecture. I think there are some examples here also of the the gay pride. Um, yes, can you say yes. a bit about that? Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, as we, uh, the, the the event that was happening that should have in the street was merged, it was migrated. For for the internet, but mostly with, but mostly and very important to the urban area. That the, the gay parade, uh, the pride parade in Brazil, usually uh, concentrates about two or three million people in the Avenida Paulista, and this was an action with the artist, the uh, vet artist. Uh, it was so, sponsored by um, a PepsiCo product. But what's really interesting is how. Uh, uh, how this, uh, how there was quickly a new um, impact. Uh, sorry, how it was uh, quickly the the market and the and the producer really adapted to this new scenario and producing quickly very interesting exhibitions and and events and acts. There's another image that I think is very nice, which was uh, the the um, the Pride Parade with performance of of many artists also yep. projected in yeah that image in the, yeah in facets um, all over the city we so, have we have time for uh, for one more example uh yeah. you already said that it was uh, what was interesting was that activists or cultural centers uh, um, sort of joined in uh, but also mm -hmm. local governments started to sponsor particular projects also in the in a sort of more cultural and artistic space something you called yeah. sociopoetics can you say something about um uh, yes. the one project um, on the right hand yes, and, and uh, I think uh, so during July in the Black, Life, Black Lives Matter became very strong here uh, also because um, three uh, well I'll just go faster and uh, and then a uh, uh, curator and some employees of the municipality get together and build it in one month an exhibition that calls voices against race, racism like the arts of the resistance that uh, uh, come together all this movement that we're having about tearing down movement and uh, racist architecture and racist monuments and actually building up something that we wanted uh, for a better, like a common future. This, uh, I just will outline this project, uh, the, the, Nilo, the Nilson Baniwa, that's, it was a projection and in the Voices Against Racism exhibition. And this monument that's called the Movimento of Bodherantes, this movement, I, sorry, this sculpture, this big landmark in the city, uh, actually represents the colonialism and how the, the Bandeirantes, the people, were actually son of the Portuguese that was slavering the Indians, uh, provoking genocides, and also and also with laboring and, and killing all the, the, the black slaveries that was fugitives um, as well. So this artist, the new Sumbaniwa was invited, he's an artist and indigenous from Amazon tribe to, re to, to reconsider, to, re uh, to recreate it, a new meeting for this movement, for this uh, construction. And what I think was really interesting is that he actually uh, projected, and in the beginning it was five million video. Projected uh, the Portuguese ships running by forces of nature. Then it was projected 
uh, uh, trees and, and a lot of nature images. And the most important was these images of in Banawa tribe representing the, 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 the beings, the spiritual beings and the beings of the forest. Yeah, thanks. So uh, it's a beautiful example of media architecture reinterpreting uh, the meaning of a historic mm -hmm. monument, sort of claiming it back from an indigenous uh, perspective. And I think that's a really important example of uh, what media architecture can do also in, in public space, layering it with additional meanings in uh, what we can mm -hmm. call social politics. Uh, thank you, Maria, for joining us from, from Sao thank Paulo. Um, and now we'll move on to our next uh, two speakers. Um, we've seen the impact that media architecture can have on public space, but now we're moving to another perspective, that of more than human architecture. And I'm going to do that with uh, Glenda Coldwell and Marcus Foth. Both are based at uh, the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane. And Glenda is an associate professor there um, in architecture. Um, and Marcus Foth is a full professor in urban informatics. He's a founder of the Urban Informatics Lab there as well. And um, I remember that I think the, um, um, yeah, I countered one of his books more than 10, 15 years ago. It was one of the first books I read on this topic, The Handbook of Urban Informatics. Uh, Marcus was one of the first one to claim for a more human-centered perspective on the smart city. But now he's moved beyond that and together with Glenda, he's calling for a more than human uh, perspective on media architecture. Um, it's 2.30 a.m. Uh, in uh, Brisbane uh, right now. So for that reason, they are not joining us live, but I pre-recorded uh, an interview with Glenda and Marcus. Okay, welcome to the program, uh, Glenda Coldwell and Marcus Foth, uh, all the way from Brisbane in, uh, in Australia. We've pre-recorded this because uh, it's right now uh, in the middle of the night uh, in Australia. So thanks for, for being available. Um, Glenda, Marcus, uh, two years ago, you presented a paper at the Media Architecture Biennale that was quite influential, and the paper was called More Than Human Media Architecture. Uh, Marcus, what, what did you mean by that? The, um, the idea behind that paper was to um, hopefully um, spark a, a discussion and a debate amongst the media architecture community about the impact of some of these media architecture projects and installations on the environment. And um, also trying to um, critically engage with a, with a more genuine debate around sustainability. So as an example, if you look at um, a lot of the media architecture installations, they um, obviously thrive in, in dark environments at nighttime in order to, to really feature um, the, um, the impact and the, um, the kind of spectacle on the human. And, and also that's how we, we've always been appreciating media architecture, facade installations and, and light installations. But if you look at it from a, from a different perspective, from the perspective of not a human being, but from the perspective of, say, uh, insects or, or animals um, that are nocturnal, then the light actually is itself a, a problem. And so that's not necessarily a, yeah. a new invention that we've come up with, but I think what we are trying to do with that paper is to actually turn that perspective around and have a more critical view on what the implications are of some of these media architecture projects. Glenda, um, you've brought some images as well, because in the paper you also give a number of examples of projects that sort of contribute to a more than human media architecture in a, in a positive way, or that could sort of uh, inspirational for media architecture uh, designers. Um, can you talk us through your examples? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, so one of the examples that um, we refer to is some of the work from Don Rose, Rosegard of Studio Rosegard. Um, and he uh, is a designer who, who spends a lot of time looking at how to raise awareness um, about sustainable issues and how to use technology um, to uh, highlight um, the relationship of people with technology. So one of the examples that we talk about is Waterlit and, and it's quite a, it's quite a big sort of impact in the public space and uh, many people can engage with that. Uh, the Waterlift was actually done here in Amsterdam in front of the Rijksmuseum, a very beautiful um, uh, installation here. Um, what exactly did you did you uh, like about it? Or why is it an interesting example? Uh, well, for, I haven't I haven't had the pleasure to actually experience it myself. So I've just um, experienced it through the pictures that I've seen and what I've read about it. 
but um, from looking at the images, you can see that a lot of people are interacting with the installation. Um, and it has, you know, quite a big presence in that public space. And it's also um, very low impact in terms of, um, you know, its physical uh, presence. It's a temp temporary installation um, that, yes, it does happen at night, but, um, you know, it's ephemeral. Um, it's, it looks incredibly engaging um, and really beautiful and, um, you know, really evokes that sense of what it must feel like to, to be underwater in this sort of um, virtual, but yet you're in that physical sort of uh, public space. Um, so, yeah, I just think right. it's a really beautiful. Right. So it's a very sort of immersive experience. And at the same time, it puts sort of really this issue really out there, right? Sort of it really reminds you of this more than human future that we need to start thinking into account. Yes, exactly. Um, because, yeah, he's yeah. really driven with linking humans in nature through his work um, and how to, to get people to experience that and think about it and, and immerse themselves in those experiences. You also brought some work from uh, Natalie Jeremy Jenko. Yes, um, so she's another um, really exciting sort of designer and artist who um, she runs the environmental health clinic and lab. And the image that I have is of the butterfly bridge. So although it may not necessarily be a media architecture example, but um, because you know it doesn't, um, it's it's sort of low tech. But it, this example is um, really nice in the way that it's creating an infrastructure to support um, butterflies um, in in this environment that we've obviously. Um, you know, he are heavily impacting. Um, so the butterfly bridge is about creating that overpass. And it's um, in the image, you can see that there's um, the sort of canvas that goes from one street pole to another. And then uh, it has plants and beautiful flowers. And the idea is that the butterflies can cross safely um, so that they're not hit by cars or, you know, other sort of traffic. Um, so it it's a really, again, like a low, low impact um, but lo low impact in terms of the physical thing that she's putting into the environment, but highly impactful in the welfare of something so beautiful like a butterfly. Great. And you brought a third project? Yes. Yeah, so a third project, which actually um, we didn't talk about in our paper, but um, the more that, um, you know, things like Industry 4.0 and advanced manufacturing is infiltrating how we um, make things. Um, so this is a, it, it is an image that um, we did see at the MAB um, 2018, and it's an image of Where Do We Go From Here by Jason Brugge's studio. So it's the industrial robots that are placed in the public um, public place, um, and, and it's in, it's, um, and these industrial robots are, performing in that public space. Um, so when we talk about, you know, more than human, of course, it's that connection to nature um, that um, we, we, we're, we're talking about. But the other side of it is, well, how do these um, non-natural beings, what is the role that they have to play in this more than human scenario? Um, so I'm quite interested in looking at how these advanced technologies um, can help us to raise awareness, can help us hopefully to also create and, you know, manufacture and build responsibly, hopefully with um, uh, materials that might be less impactful in the environment and also make the processes more efficient. Um, so there is a role that they play, but I think that role um, we have to approach with a lot of caution and with a lot of respect. Um, and in, in sort of embracing these technologies. Um, so that's- Yeah, that's interesting. So you're you're extending the more than human category, not just to sort of other forms of life, but also to sort of, uh, um, yeah, uh, non-life forms, uh, objects, uh, technologies, robots, maybe even artificial intelligence. Um, uh, other people in this space uh, are maybe all, are also working with uh, uh, bacteria and algae and other kinds of sort of um, living, materials 
um, yeah, that also sounds like a really interesting direction um, uh, to to, uh, to to explore from a media architecture perspective. Uh, Marcus, going back to you, um, how could we do that? I mean, uh, we've seen some really interesting examples. We've seen sort of the urgency to do that. Um, what kind of new methods or approaches do we need for that? So I think one thing to recognize for, for our community is that there is already quite a, a, a diversity and wealth of um, contributions and, and publications and, and projects and artistic work out there. So it's not that our paper invented this. What we really wanted to do with that paper was to um, draw attention to actually a much longer history of contributions, especially in the environmental humanities. Um, now, I think our work then is that of, of translation and making sense of it and how it can be applied and deployed and, and tailored to the needs and the, the specifics of media architecture, for instance. And so I think there's two, two specific aspects. One is um, to reduce harm, and the other one is to increase benefit. So one of the things we talk about, the, the notion of reducing harm is a little bit more straightforward. So it's the energy and, and, uh, and electricity impact. It's about the materials. It's about the way that often media architecture uh, installations are temporal. What happens to them afterwards? Can they be reused, recycled, redeployed? But then the other part, I think, is um, just as uh, important and maybe a bit more challenging, which is that we actually also need to consider how media architecture projects are not just creating a benefit for the human experience from the point of view of, of human comfort and, and human um, uh, convenience, but, but also how it can create a, a benefit for, for the planet. And you brought a you brought a picture from a workshop where you were sort of exploring some some new methodologies and approaches. Um, yeah. What am I seeing um, here? I'm seeing I think it's you wearing a, a mask. What's happening? That's right. Um, so we've done a workshop as part of the participatory design conference in in 2018 as well. Some of this work is still continuing with colleagues such as um, Sarah Heitlinger and and Rachel Clark and uh, Anne Light and Laura Polano and Carl Di Salvo. And so what, what we've been doing is kind of think about the kinds of methods that we want to um, use and tailor and customize to bring about a more than human design approach. And so that workshop, particularly, we actually were in, um, in Hasselt and in Genk in Belgium as part of PDC 18. And we assumed the persona of different um, local um, animals uh, so I think I'm wearing a, um, a, a mask of a bee. And so we are trying to look at the city from the point of view of a honeybee. So to actually, for instance, consider what's the seasonality of the flowers that are available, um, what are the risks for the animal with regards to pollutants, with regards to other kinds of dangers such as mobile phone towers. Um, is the habitat available? Can, can a, a honeybee colony um, replicate, which is swarming, and would that be seen as a as a problem in an urban environment? Would there be um, um, is that something that is um, supported and allowed, or is it going to be restricted? So we we were thinking through um, all of these different um, considerations, and also how interspecies and multi uh, multi species entanglements require us to come up with with compromise. We're, we're, we're two years uh, after, right? It's two years ago that you presented uh, this modern human media architecture paper. And as Marcus said, of course, it was not um, something that came out of the air. It's been discussed in other disciplines as well. But for the media architecture uh, world, I think it was kind of a, a first introduction um, to discuss this at the conference. Um, what has happened since? Um, well, we've been busy and uh, one of the great outcomes was collaborating with some of our other colleagues here at QUT, um, Susan Lowe, Marcus, myself, um, Associate Professor Veronica Garcia Hansen and Mark Thompson. So we collaborated on a paper called A More Than Human Perspective on Understanding the Performance of the Built Environment. So we were looking at um, looking at different um, green building rating tools and trying to assess um, 
their, I guess, their position within that more than human um, sort of space. And, and we did a critique of these rating tools and found that there's a, there's a lot more work that can be done to bring in the, um, or to acknowledge the relationship between buildings and nature. And, and the other thing is the uh, more than human group, which I think Marcus can talk about that we've, uh, that he's really leading at QUT. Yeah, um, Marcus, to wrap up, the more than human group. Yeah, sure. So that's the other thing that we've been working towards, which is that um, we obviously also want to um, put our, you know, um, money where our mouth is and um, and act on some of these um, more theoretical insights. And so as a result, we've actually started a bit of a radical turnaround and shift. So um, our group uh, for the last decade and, and more has followed a very human-centric approach, and we are increasingly critical of that and are trying to do better. And so we've been collaborating with colleagues in the um, ecological justice um, team in our faculty of law with colleagues in in other parts of um, QUT, other faculties to come together and we formed a more than human research group that is looking at more than human futures. And so it's a it's a quite interdisciplinary group that brings together some interests out of the uh, environmental humanities, the creative practice and the design fields and design disciplines. And um, it's relatively new. So we were approved by the university in July, um, but it has already um, gathered a lot of interest and um, attention from, from other colleagues across the campus. And so we are now on a, on a path of looking at um, what kinds of projects we want to do. We've been starting to recruit um, PhD students and we've um, obviously continuing to publish but we're also very interested in internationalizing this. And so there is, I think, now a bit of a nascent emerging um, movement, I think, of more and more uh, people across the design um, spectrum uh, and media architecture spectrum that are jumping on yeah. this bandwagon. Thank you, uh, Glenda and Marcus, for sharing these insights. Uh, this uh, all sounds very um, exciting. Um, uh, also a new group uh, that you both are involved in. Um, just to start, but I'm sure that uh, at the next MIB we will uh, hear a lot more about uh, that and the projects that you've been uh, starting to engage in. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, thanks for this and hopefully see you in June, July in Amsterdam and Utrecht at the Media Architect. Yeah, thanks again, uh, Marcus and, and Glenda. And uh, one of the outcomes of the paper that I presented last year is that from this year on, the MAB uh, will have a new award category, which is the More Than Human Media Architecture category. So if you have done work in, um, yeah, in that field, please send in your projects. Um, you can see um, everything about the call at our website, mab20.org. Moving on to our last candidate, Catherine Willis, a professor in smart cities and communities at uh, Plymouth um, University. Uh, but today, um, Catherine, uh, we invited you because you're also the program leader for an MA a program in Smart Urban Futures, a program that, uh, as the websites, website says, will equip its students to address design challenges at the boundaries between smart technologies and urban planning. Uh, welcome, Catherine. Thanks for having me, Martin. Um, why did you start this program? Why did you feel the urge? Well, we've been doing research in the field of smart cities um, over a number of years um, and just finding that when we went to talk to cities about their projects, that there really was this point. I think you've talked a little bit about it in your discussion about promises. You know, you, we heard a lot of promises, <laughs> a lot of potential, but actually the delivery of projects that really worked with, with the city was often really poor and not sustained. Um, I mean, I think if you can, if you look around you, you know, if we go out into the city around us, if people think about the city where they live, if they go out, we've, we've been talking about smart cities or digital cities for decades, and we go out into the city space and it's still, it's still very much the materiality and the physical space of the city and the digitalists have laid on top or maybe has broken or, so we, we wanted to think, you know, it, there's a real design challenge to, to design smart cities from, from an urban perspective. And there's a need for people to have um, a really 
basically a synthesis and mix of skills that links both an understanding and a, and, a, and a knowledge of the digital, but also a knowledge and an understanding of the physical space, the materiality, the design of of an urban environment or non-urban yeah, environment. Yeah, because uh, I think that's what you found lacking, right? Um, you told me that you went into uh, the teams that were implementing all those smart city projects in cities like Glasgow and London, and you started talking with them, and then you realized that none of them had a background in urban planning or architecture. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I think yeah. that the um, that was definitely the case. We were, we were finding out when we went to talk about the Smart Cities project where we would end up in the City Council and often we'd end up in the Economic Development Department and sometimes in the police. Um, so we actually had some projects which we looked at in Brazil. So in Brazil we went to some control rooms around Smart Cities which were run by the police. So <laughs> that, that gives you an insight into where Smart Cities really really belong in some in some um in some context yeah so he was thinking well should should we not have come ended up in the urban planning or urban planning department or maybe in the public health or or the um cultural department but generally that's not where the, the impetus for these projects lay or the expertise lay yeah again and uh, we've discussed it also earlier uh, today uh, stefan uh, the shaping of the city is in the hand of the technology companies rather than the architects and the planners um why why is that problematic i mean they seem to have pretty good solutions well, generally, there's a there's if you don't understand if you're not able as a as a city. Say you're looking at a city. If you're not able to understand the multiple ways in which a city operates or is designed or the way that people inhabit it, if you're asking someone else to provide that expertise and you don't understand it, you know, much like the person who says, "Well, I don't know how to work PowerPoint, so you just fix it on for me," and then it doesn't work and things break down. So that's a really basic example. But in a city. If you don't understand how data works or you don't understand how if your bus system has got a, a live data feed that that's going to affect how the bus actually operates you really lack it you're, you're outsourcing your knowledge to somebody who's essentially um not going to give you the best the best options for what what your city might want and there's there's generally governance issues there as well yeah, so, so yeah, I guess you, the conclusion you took is we need a new type of professional, uh, somebody who understands both the urban planning world as well as the world of data and interactive, uh, interactive technologies. So how do, you, how do you address it in your program? How do you train people to become that person? So we, we've looked a lot at the sort of design, the, the sort of design approaches that can link the digital and the physical worlds. Um, and we've got, um, say from William Mitchell, we've got this idea of recombinant architecture, which is where you take functional programs and remix them. So you sort of uh, you take take one in a library becomes a workspace becomes a cafe. So you start to mix multiple spaces, which you probably see mostly with COVID, you know, where people's home becomes their office and the digital enables that mix between the spaces. And then I think Martin, there's, there's, there's some work you've done around the city's interface. So thinking about how the city itself become the city is an interface into different worlds. Um, so we've been thinking about those, but one of the ways we've tried to, to teach this is to really break down that barrier between thinking about the distinction with the digital and physical um, and looking at how to design for, for what the space or what the what the opportunities in that in that in the way that the space is inhabited are, and then looking at where the material or the physical space gives you opportunities and where the digital maybe adds things in. So trying to break down that 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 uh, distinction between the digital and physical and treat them as um, ways that we interact that allow that allow us to see the world, that allow us to in, interact with that world in different ways. Yeah, so, so it's it's more of a, a design approach than purely a, a technological or an engineering approach. Um, how does that? How how do you sort of operationalize operationalize that way of design in your program? What do you teach students to do? So, so the first thing we start with is is not what. The, so if you think about a sort of engineering approach, which a lot of tech does. It starts with, well, what, we're going we're gonna to solve a problem, so let's find a problem. Or we've solved it, now we need to find out what it was. But we start with, what, what are the opportunities? Where, where is the need? What, what are the challenges we want to address? And then starting to unpick those and think about what might be the best way to address them. What, what are the sort of sticky problems out there that we could, or the opportunities out there? So we start with a fairly open mind and blue sky, and then we start to work with, with the prototyping approach. So we prototype different different um, layers of, of thinking about how we work between the digital and physical and making those merged merged environments yeah um, uh, and then yeah. now one of the things you said is that uh, you don't do user testing but you do ethnography um, what do you mean with that well I suppose that this sort of cut this sort of 
links to the term which is co-design or co-production which I think is can be a little bit overused but generally what we're doing is throughout the whole process we go and, and listen so you know you need to listen and you need to incorporate you need to listen to, to people or to groups that will potentially inhabit or want to work with the spaces or the technologies that you're working within and so that becomes a core part of the design process so we we try to treat the university as a porous space so rather than you know, the ivory tower model of a university where you sort of you know you hone this this specialist knowledge we 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 eke out and we encourage students to really spend as much time working in real world situations getting out into spaces or working environments in which they want to to create their projects so that with they that we look out rather than we look out and and come back in um, yeah. and that co-design approach is sort of embedded within okay. And you uh, you brought some projects as well from the students uh, uh, of how that sort of actually looks. Can you, can you what are we looking at here? Yeah, I mean this this looks rather techy this project, but it was a really um, interesting project in terms of understanding. That it worked with uh, trying to en enable people to experience um, spaces who have hidden disabilities, so people on the autism spectrum. And there's a real challenge with um, some environments where people just aren't experiencing those spaces at all. So this was a, a wearable that enabled um, people who have hidden disabilities, such as those in the autism spectrum, to in, to to move through a space, but to to um, to do that in some sort of guided way. So that it took it took um, data from the environment and from their their own body and used that as a way to support them as they move through. So there's some there's some um, I, we we worked a lot with um, some local local um, autism groups and with um, this was one of these project was for a, um, a gallery space yeah, and so understand the requirements of the space. An interesting example, I think, of how uh, people from different disciplines come together, uh, do actual uh, ethnographic re uh, user research, um, think of it from a particular problem space. Um, to round off, um, you've set up this program, but you've also taken the initiative together with uh, Alex Arrighi and Nana Verhoef and Michiel de Lange to um, start the Media Architecture Biennale Academy. Can you say a bit more about that? Yes, well, I think you've officially announced it because we're, we're sort of, it's something which we're working on at the moment and hopefully we'll, we'll be featured next year with the Media Architecture Biennale in, um, in summer next year. So again, looking at this idea that there are many people working in this media architecture space as educators or developing practices that they teach. Um, and we really, and, and students in the space, PhD students, we want to create um, an academy type environment which we can share best practice look at methods for collaboration or how we might share knowledge and also um, to think about the frameworks in which we teach um, or the way that we share knowledge amongst each other and, and look sort of create better ways that we can treat the sort of this, um, this field of media architecture which to some extent is still slightly undefined and actually start to be much more to treat it as a, a field that we can start to own much more clearly uh, particularly within an academic environment but also externally. So we're quite happy to invite people who are working in that field to, to join um, and create the academy as a space for, for um, people to come together and to, to build that, that field. Okay, well, thanks, Catherine. Uh, anybody who's interested, please uh, go to our website, uh, mab20.org. And um, with that, we've come to the end of this program. Um, thank you so much, uh, all, the, all the guests, uh, for sharing their insights on the promises of uh, new urban technologies and uh, the impact that they could have on our cities. Um, if you're interested in this and you want to contribute, uh, we have a call for papers that is open, uh, and we also have a call for the MAB Award. So if you have made any kind of media architecture your work yourself, please send it in for awards. Uh, you have until the 1st of February to do so. We will be continuing this series of programs around the Media Architecture Biennale for the coming months, ending uh, hopefully in our final event next year, uh, June 28th to July the 2nd in Amsterdam and Utrecht. And we hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you.